First off, apologies for the quarantine hair. It's a bit of an unruly mess. I don't really know what I can do with it. I could probably go to the barber. My barber is in fact open. I just don't think I'm ready to go to the barber when wearing a mask. I could shave it off completely. I have done that in the past before. I am toying with the idea of just shaving the middle part and going full fryer tuck. But I kind of like this as a record of the length of the quarantine. Maybe I will keep it as far as long as I'm working from home. It's just that with every passing week, it gets more and more crazy old guy hair. Now, second of all, I want to thank Giamano Centeno, who wrote an article for Book Riot called 15 Fantastic YouTube Book Reviewers for Your Viewing Pleasure. And she mentioned me in this channel, along with 14 others. It's a pretty illustrious company, and I'm totally flattered. This prompted a friend of mine who discovered the channel as a result of the article to ask, well, isn't booktube book review a bit of a redundancy? At which point I had to explain, no, in fact, booktube is mostly hauls, unboxings, TBRs, wrap-ups, spilling tea, canceling people, shooting drama, and tags. And so naturally, after getting called out for book reviews, I too am going to shoot a tag because everybody knows nobody watches book reviews in the first place. So this is the POC creator tag. I was tagged by Marissa at Little Book Spider, and this was created by Yumi, the book demon. So let's get to it. What ethnicity or race do you identify as and are you intersectional? So I'm a second generation South Korean. Both my parents are from South Korea. They met here in Canada where they had me and they were and still are avid Anglophiles, which means they never taught me the Korean language. The Korean language was always their secret language to talk about punishments and the like. So I never learned much to my shame, which means I don't go into Korean variety stores at all for the fear that they're going to try and talk to me in Korean and I won't understand them and I'll have to answer them in English and I'll feel shame and then I'll feel like they're judging my parents because they didn't teach me Korean and it's a whole thing. I mean, I still go to the Korean food store here in town because it's the Korean food store. I have to. But I've been so adamant about uh, speaking English there that now they don't even bother trying to speak to me in Korean. But I will say I'm grateful to have been introduced to Korean food from a very early age because like, it just opened my eyes to a whole bunch of different flavors. I mean, my wife didn't have garlic until it was her 20s. And I mean, vegetables were just something you boiled. You covered in cheese if you're feeling fancy. I mean, I have coworkers that hadn't had curry until their 30s. And for other friends, I mean, sweet and sour chicken balls are the height of exotic fare. So I'm grateful for the food part of it. I'm a second generation Korean in a mostly white town. I mean, this is a Germanic town that was originally called Berlin until World War II in which it changed its name. So not a lot of other Asians around, which I think is important because I grew up in an era of long duck dong and short round. Um, and it's different from a California Asian who's surrounded by a lot of other Asians. I mean, I didn't have boba until I was in my late 30s. So this meant a lot of internalized racism and aggressive distancing from the fobs in town. And uh, frankly, just working so hard to be as white adjacent as possible, actually, like a total Twinkie. Number two, tell us something that you love about yourself. All right, this is a bit of a tough one. I know invariably those things that you love about yourself or in other people can become the thing that really frustrates you about them at the same time. That friend that's hilarious, that's a lot of fun at bars and social events, can also be the one that is frustratingly unable to offer any sort of comfort when the chips are down. Now, for me, I was raised in the Christian faith. I've gone to Presbyterian churches, United, Anglican, Baptist, you name it. But it was what I learned in the one Buddhist or Buddhist faith that really stuck with me, the idea of the middle path. Now, this is something I picked up when I was in South Korea, in a South Korean monastery, not speaking Korean. So broad strokes here. It's like going to Rome to learn about Christianity and not speaking Italian. For me, anyway, this seems to be in line with my introverted way of being. As far as I interpret it, the middle path is avoiding extremes of emotion. I know there's people that swing broadly from exuberance to absolute misery. And I don't know if I could have made it through the world with those extremes of emotion. I'm a big believer in the power of meh. I tend to swing between amusement to melancholia. And I think that's really held me in good stead as I've weathered some really difficult times. I mean, I'm a little bit older, which means I've seen my fair share of pain and suffering, and I know that there's a lot more in store. And add to that, I think we as readers tend to be a lot more empathetic, and there's research that proves that out which means we are more susceptible to these wide swings of emotion. And I don't know how I would have gotten through life if it weren't for the fact that 
I just sort of tend to stick to that middle way. And maybe this is just a fancy woo way of justifying my complete lack of emotion, but whatever. I do appreciate that. And it's especially holding me in good stead in the quarantining of the dumpster fire of 2020. Number three, how long have you been part of the book community? Well, this started almost 10 years ago with an insistence that I write a review for every single book that I read on Goodreads. I was one of those people that would pick up a book, finish it, put it down, and completely forget about it. So I thought, I need to sit with this book after I finish it for a bit, compose my thoughts, and put it down on paper. And so BookTube naturally progressed from there. And I've been doing it for about five years now. And I'm so grateful for everyone that comes by, checks out the video, leaves a comment down below. I recently hit the 9,000 subscriber mark, which is such a huge milestone. And I'm just so grateful for that. Because frankly, I'm completely wrong for the booktube aesthetic. I've aged out by a couple decades. I read literary fiction and I film mostly book reviews. I shouldn't have as many views as I do. So thank you very much. Now, earlier I mentioned a friend of mine discovering my channel as a result of the Book Riot article. And that seems a little odd, but I don't talk about the booktube channel with the people around me in real life. And Part of it is the imposter syndrome, the other part is just crippling self-consciousness. But I also think if their book is short, they can discover this naturally. I don't need to be flogging this on the Facebook and the Twitter and the Instagram and the like and putting it in their face all the time. I like this tiny little corner of the internet that I've carved for myself here on BookTube. And so I'm happy to have all of you here with me. Thanks. Number four, what kind of content do you create? Tell us about anything that you're creating outside of BookTube. Well, I work in marketing, which is basically BookTube for money. I write stuff, shoot and edit video, create content. Same, same, right? Yeah, I'm lucky that I get the chance to work with some truly awesome people that I'm missing a lot, even though I'm working with them virtually now. Uh, the city where I live has got a really rich tech ecosystem, which means that everyone is connected to everyone else by two degrees of separation, tops. And that also means that I have the good fortune with some of my coworkers now of having worked with him with as many as three other jobs in the past, which probably also speaks to how old I am. In any case, I am just grateful to be able to do what it is that I do. Number five, what is your favorite genre to read? Well, I'm all about the literary fiction, which really isn't a genre. I mean, I will read sci-fi. Um, I dive into horror occasionally. I will mess with uh, YA as well. I don't read a lot of fantasy or romance, but I don't exclude them. Love comics, graphic novels. Try and pick them up whenever I can get my hands on them. But really, I am all about the award long lists, the Giller Prize, the Booker, the National Book Awards, the Tournament of Books. I mean, literary fiction, I guess. And I will absolutely pick up any book written by a Korean, translated or otherwise. And I have to say, 2020, the list of translated Korean novels that are out is huge. My super secret TBR list has gotten quite big as a result. Can't wait to dive into a lot of those. Number six, what are your top three favorite books? Impossible question. The top three favorite books changes depending on when you ask. So for the purposes of this tag, let's say Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. Love this book. Can't wait for the ad Apple TV adaptation that is hopefully coming soon. It is about the Zainichi, ethnic Koreans born and raised in Japan. Japan and Korea, a lot of animosity, which means that the Koreans in Japan are looked down upon. Um, they can only advance to a certain level in society. They can't even hold certain types of jobs. They can't go back to Korea because Koreans eyed them with suspicion. They are basically stateless citizens home to a country that doesn't exist, a unified Korea. Fantastic read. Uh, Chimamande Ngozi Adichie's Americana. I mean, you know you're the real deal when Beyonce is dropping lines from your book into our music. I love this. You can open the book to any page and just be stunned by the level of writing there. It's a little dated in that it's following a blogger of all things, but loved it. And um, Michael Crummy's Sweetland. I was at a Michael Crummy signing some time ago, met a couple of super fans. Their arms completely filled with Michael Crummy books, everything he's written, poetry collections, articles in magazines in the hopes that he would be signing them. He elicits that type of fervor from his fans. And I just love this book. This is a love letter to Michael Crummy's native homeland of Newfoundland, as well as a meditation on death. Beautifully written. Um, I loved his The Innocence that was recently released, um, but the super fans insist I need to check out River Thieves. Number seven, tell us about your favorite POC authors. All right, finally some bookish stuff. Let's settle in. Let's go. So we have Kylie Reads, uh, Such a Fun Age. This is the book that pushed me out of my pandemic slump. Love this. While you're out there looking for black authors to read, pick this one up for a light skewering of well-meaning woke white liberals. We have Jesse Thistles from The Ashes. 
This is a memoir about a high school dropout turned homeless druggie in and out of prison, barely makes it out alive. Spoiler alert, he ends up becoming assistant professor of Métis studies at York University, wins a Governor General Academic Medal, as well as a Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Vanier Scholar. Um, this is just a compelling read. It is a wonder he got out of this thing alive. Megan Gale Coles, Small Game Hunting at the Local Coward Gun Club. This was by far my favorite Canadian read of the last year. It's a Me Too novel centered on an upscale restaurant in St. John's, Newfoundland called The Hazel. And no one gets out of this thing unscathed. It is dark. It's unrelenting, um, unforgiving. It is a bit of a hard read, but well worth it. I admit, I stumbled a little bit at the beginning. It took me a while to settle in, but once you do, it's full throttle all the way through. Ian Williams' Reproduction, one of my favorite readings from the last year. This from the Giller Award-winning novel. Williams got on stage and decided to, for his passions, to read, pick the section where one of the preteen protagonists um, imagines a spermatozoa going to impregnate an egg and the ensuing dialogue that happens, as well as various impregnation scenarios that involve tic tacs, doorknobs, and belly buttons. Just the perfect choice for this award-winning novel, and it proves that I love poets who decide to write novels. A Place for Us by Fatima Farhin Mirza, debut novel from a 26-year-old that just blew me away about a Muslim family trying to make their way in America post 9-11. But the thing that really wrecked me is the father figure in the story rendered through the eyes of his children and then later through his own eyes. This coming from a 26-year-old just completely wrecked me. So good. Severance by Ling Ma. This has been getting a lot of play as people have been looking for pandemic apocalyptic reads. So in this case, the Shen fever also originates in China, um, traps people into familiar routines. So you end up setting the table over and over again until you die or trapped in a resale store folding clothes over and over. So come for the zombie apocalypse, but stay for the examination of capitalist culture and surviving while being othered. Um, IQ and Righteous by Joe Ide. I read these two back to back. I was listening to an interview with Joe Ide recently talking about his frustration having written dozens of screenplays, none of them getting picked up, so he decided to switch gears and start writing a novel. So this is basically Sherlock Holmes in the hood. Isaiah Kintabe, or IQ, and his sidekick Dodson solve crimes in East LA. Joe Ide grew up in East LA, so he nails the language and vernacular down. Ironically, this novel has gotten picked up by Snoop Dogg, the executive producer, and will hopefully be turned into a TV series. Goodbye Vitamin by Rachel Kong. It's a bittersweet Alzheimer's novel. Uh, we meet Ruth, our 30-year-old protagonist, sitting alone in her apartment that she's supposed to share with her fiancé. Except on the moving day, her fiancé announces that he's staying at the old apartment with his new girlfriend, so she finds herself there alone, decides to go home for the holidays, finds out her dad has been having a few memory lapses. Sounds super fun, I know. But it's basically a year in the life, early stages of Alzheimer's, really just sort of bittersweet and melancholic. Perfect. Loved it. Uh, Dexter Palmer's version control. This is a smart time travel novel that's not trying to impress you with a timey-wimey bag of tricks. It is much more a thoughtful examination of relationships, race, and big data. And frankly, this is one of those books that gets slept on. I don't know why it doesn't get mentioned more when we're talking sci-fi written by black authors. Fantastic read. Private Citizens by Tony Tootle Tamudi. I absolutely love this book, so much so that as soon as I finished it, I picked it up and read it from the beginning again, just so I could get on the same level as the meta-awareness of the novel itself. I mean, it is such a debut novel filled with ideas, and it preemptively acknowledges how on the nose it is to be writing about a bunch of millennial screw-ups before you can bitch about the fact that you're reading about a bunch of millennial screw-ups. So good. Uh, Shelter by Jun Young. This is family drama as tense thriller featuring the Cho family. This is dark, heavy stuff, and it has one of those main characters that you just frustrate you to no end. You find yourself wanting to throw the book across the room like repeatedly because he just drives you so crazy. But then you go, you pick up the book because you can't stop. It is so compelling. Uh, you can't look away. Signs Preceding the End of the World by Yuri Harara, translated from the Spanish by Lisa Dillman. This is a slim novel, barely 100 pages, that follows migrants as they travel from Mexico into the United States, it slips between reality and myth. Dillman would win the Best Translated Work of Fiction Award in 2016, well-deserved for this particular book. 
Where the Air is Sweet by Tasneen Jamal, a local writer, a five-star read. I love this. It is basically about the expulsion of 80,000 Asians from Uganda during the reign of Idi Amin, following a single family as they try to rebuild their life in southern Ontario. And it's just one of those books that you want to put into people's hands and tell them to read. It's got less than 500 reviews on Goodreads, and frankly, that is a crime. This thing is fantastic. Well worth checking out. Day Trippers, a graphic novel by brothers Fabio Moon and Gabriel Ba. The artwork is beautiful and colorful, and the story about these pivotal moments in life. Well worth checking out. I discovered this one as a result of Gabriel Ba's work on the Umbrella Academy, which is also fantastic, and the Netflix TV show coming in for its second season soon. Well worth checking out as well. Paul Beatty's a sellout. A hilarious read. It's basically the story of a black protagonist awaiting trial as he's trying to resegregate his town of Dickens in the south side of Los Angeles with the help of the last little rascal, Hominy Jenkins. I mean, what more needs to be said? Number eight, where can we find you outside of YouTube? It's all over the map, really. I'm on Twitter, but that's really locally focused. My ambient news source, it's where I go to to find out why the power's out in my neighborhood or to find out that there's a new bakery opening up downtown. Clearly, I am doing it wrong. I should be on the Twitter there, monitoring booktube drama, issuing cancellations, and making sweeping hot takes. Instagram, also all over the map. Yes, I do post pictures of books, but a lot of booze and cigars and the occasional houseplant, really, and I post there about as frequently as I do here on booktube, which is not a lot, so I'm frankly doing social wrong, but that's where I am elsewhere. Not to mention the Discord. All of these links are down below. Number nine, shout out some awesome POC creators. For this, I'm gonna focus on podcasts. I consume a lot of them. And these are some of my favorites from POC creators. We have Code Switch from NBR. It's talking about race hosted by Shireen Marisol Maraji and Gene Denby. A recent episode is talking about why Black Lives Matter now, as opposed to uh, Eric Garner in 2014 and Philando Castile in 2016. Um, another episode talked about the myths that families tell about themselves and their ancestors and how dark and troubling that can be when we're talking about black lives going back a few generations. There's also still processing from the New York Times featuring Jenna Wortham and Wesley Morris, two culture writers for the New York Times. They mostly focus on movies, television shows, culture at large, talking through an intersectional lens. Um, recent episodes featured Fiona Apple, Celebrity Culture, and Westworld. Now, recently they cut short their summer hiatus to come back to record episodes specifically addressing the Black Lives Matter movement. The Asian Not Asian podcast hosted by Mike Nguyen and Fumi Abe, two New York comedians that bring in a bunch of guests, usually comedians, though they have managed to snag Min Jin Lee as well as Kevin Nguyen, two authors, great episodes, um, to talk about whatever strikes their fancy. This could be about Alison Roman or the NASCAR scandal, open relationships, or comedy in the age of coronavirus. And they're not the most progressive of dudes, but you can see them getting better with each subsequent episode thanks to some really smart guests that they bring on board. Always an interesting conversation. And finally, Today Explained from Vox, not specifically about race, but it's hosted by Sham Ramos from. This is my daily info dump about relevant topics of the day. Recent episodes are talking about trying to open up the schools in the age of coronavirus and what that might look like. Uh, coronavirus, aerosol versus droplets, trying to restart the NBA, um, the American bail system, and what it means to abolish the police. Short, concise episodes, really informative, and I love it a lot. Number 10, don't forget to tag. All right, usual suspects here. I want to tag Rincey over at Rincey Read, Justin over at Ghost Reader, and Dee Dee over at Brown Girl Reading. Um, also, if you're a creator and a person of color, you should be doing this tag as well. I'd love to hear some of your answers. Anyway, that's it for me this week. It's been so long since I've done a tag. Hopefully this turned out okay. Anyway, that's it. Hope you have a great week of reading, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.